Hello everyone, I'm Jim Sin Lee for SpeedEndurance.com and welcome to Speed Endurance TV. In today's video, uh, we take a little flashback. This was recorded about six months ago and it was a conversation between Dan Paff. At the time, he was the center director for Lee Valley of UK Athletics and we have apprentice coach Jonas Tawia Dodu asking the questions. Now, there's really two set of questions. The first was trying to understand the components of a 100 meter and 200 meter sprint. And the second question is more directed to Paralympian Johnny Peacock. So it's a long listen or a long read. Uh, I recommend watching the whole video. You'll learn a few things and you can understand the challenges that the Paralympians will have as opposed to able-bodied athletes. So uh, here's the video. Dan. Please discuss the key components of a 100 meter and 200 meter race. Well, there's lots of components, but I mean, it starts with the start. So, getting block settings that work for you, that allow you to leave the block with good power, good range, good velocities, proper angle is where it all starts. Um, I think as you look at the fundamental mechanics of acceleration, whether it's in ball sports or field sports or track and field, certain things exist. And the first thing that exists is the angle of projection as you go from no movement to movement. And in linear physics, that angle's around 45 degrees. Now, there are people that project lower, there are people that project a little bit higher. But in my research and my understanding, the farther you are away from that, you know, you're gonna pay prices later on. In acceleration, we know from the data that each stride gets longer, each stride gets quicker, ground contact times lessen, and flight times increase. This occurs through the first eight to 10 steps, no matter if they're male, female, average, world-class, what have you, these attributes, these essences occur. We see a lot of variations. We see classic starters like Jeter and some of the Jamaican women who adhere to the basic fundamental principles of biomechanics. Uh, we see We've seen people in the past, like Marie Screen, who projected quite low and stayed bent over at the waist with the head and shoulders down for an extended period of time, and he ran quite well with that way. Uh, some of the Jamaican guys to affect heel recovery off the back block uh, drag their toe. And the first thing in physics, if you increase friction, you reduce velocity. So I don't quite get it, but it works for them to some degree. As you go through those first eight to 10 steps, you're starting to become more upright. And there, of course, there's landmarks that we measure with arm position, shin angles, pelvic angles, and what have you. But most people are coming upright around the eight to 10th step. Some people with an extended uh, posture, ground phase dynamic might not be all the way up until 25 or 30 meters. Uh, but once they're upright, then again, there's certain things that occur. And flight time, leg recovery time, um, time on the ground, the amount of force produced on the ground with whatever time duration you're on the ground, those are all factors that contribute to sprint efficiency. And in the 200, we get into additional puzzles in that you're doing the first 100 in a curve. So you're fighting centripetal forces. So the position of the pelvis and your posture at key components of the curve you know, are, are critical to you maintaining the ability to apply force uniformly and to accelerate uniformly. And then once you're through the acceleration zone, to able to effectively apply forces that allow you to maintain speed. So I think there's a little bit of a rush to emulate what people are seeing, a few key people do, without understanding 
what is the real objective and what are the real mechanical things that are reported, studied, and can be replicated. And people, I think a lot of times, are looking for style rather than substance. If you become too far away from the model, so for example, coming off the blocks at 45 degrees, if you're too bent over, what are the prices that people pay? I think people that project too low or have the upper body flexed, if I have the upper body flexed, I have more weight forward of the base of support, so there's inherent over rotation occurring. So people are going to have to block or brace milliseconds upon initial landing to counteract this forward rotation. So they're going to burn more energy on the ground contact time because the first few milliseconds are being spent stopping forward rotation. Where at a cleaner angle, the entire duration of the ground contact could be used for propelling the athlete's center of mass upward and forward. What you generally see with people that project too low or that stay bent over at the waist is a lot of side to side running, zigzag run. So when you zigzag run, you, know, you put adductors at high risk, you exhaust certain ligamentous complex in the sacrum, fascial swings, put a lot of stress in the glute medius. So those kinds of injuries are more chronic in people that project low. Another thing that we're seeing a lot of in the last five to six years, people that have really extreme shin angles the first few steps uh, have a lot of lower leg problems, flexor halicus, flexor digitorum, and these lead into Achilles infiltration, and so we're seeing a lot of Achilles problems coming from these improper shin angles. Okay, let's bring things home to an athlete you've been working with uh, very hard since October, Jonathan Peacock. Specific to the components we've talked about, acceleration and top speed, can you talk about the key things that have changed over time, firstly, and then secondly, where the other components of training have aided those changes? Well, I think uh, Johnny's relatively young to the sport. I think he's 18 or about to turn 19. And I think Hale again has coached in the last year or so, did a real good job of introducing him to the basics and doing rudimentary training skills. Uh, I think when he came to us, he had no idea what world-class athletes do. So he was instantly thrown in with guys like Craig Rutherford, Reese Williams, Steve Lewis, Goldie Sayers. And they did a tremendous job of speeding up the learning curve about diet, nutrition, sleep, demeanor, the seriousness of each component of the training schedule. Um, I think that learning how to lift correctly and to have lifting that was compatible and complementary to his running workouts was a huge factor. I think getting consistent sports medicine inputs Andy Burke and, and Jerry Ranajita, Sarah, did great work in keeping him put together. Um, he has a very, very bad ankle that will need surgery at the end of the year. And so he's been running on borrowed time all year. And these guys have done a master job of keeping him able to go. In terms of the essence of his race, I think that getting consistent block setup and, and block ideologies down, what to do out of the blocks, how to move its limbs, what are the goals, teaching the model of acceleration, replicating it on a regular basis so that there was frame plasticity change. Um, upright sprinting, he was already pretty good. And so it was just a matter of him understanding what he really needed to do and how to control things, because a lot of times he got out of control, which got him out of position which in turn got him hurt. So he was pretty good upright sprinter, but he didn't know how to harness it. And so now I think he has a good idea of the sections of the race and the race model that we have planned. 
Paulo is saying that when he broke the world record in Indianapolis, he made about five major mistakes. So you'd have to give that credit to his training background and his sports medicine team, not, not the coach. He broke the record a month ago, um, running 1086. Um, how fast do you think he can run? Well, I think from training, when we time various segments. So accelerations, we time what's going on at 30 meters. When we do speed runs, we look at 50 and 60 meter splits. When we're doing alactic and special speed endurance, we look at 80, 90, and 110, 110 meter times. And if you look at the mirage of these distances and times, Everything, everything says good weather, good track, good conditions. You know, he can run 1070s for sure, maybe in the high 1060s. But that's predicated on a lot of things going on. What is the focus going into the games? What would be your, your key cue, the key reminder that you'll go over with him? Well, I think that where he can really separate himself from the rest of the field is by having a very clean drive phase. That's a, a phase that he classically messes up. So I think top end and mid race, he knows what to do and he can dig himself out of trouble. But if he really wants to put on a show and run really fast, it's, it's gonna be a couple words of encouragement and strong suggestion that he do certain things those first eight steps. What does a clean dry phase look like? What do you, what do you, what specifically do you want from those first eight steps? I want to see fast, effective, forceful block clearance so that his first step comes down a unique distance from the line. I want to see a 45 degree angle upon block clearance. Each successive step, it's the ABCs of sprint mechanics. Ground contact times lessen, stride lengths increase, flight times increase, shin angles, hip angles, torso and head change in a uniform manner. Too many people try to get cute with a unique cue. The mechanics are the mechanics. And athletes have tendencies to violate one or several of those laws. So you focus the teaching and the cueing where the virus occurs. Has the virus been the same throughout the year? Yes. He's at a level where he can execute very consistently in training, whether it's a gun start or he starts on his own. Where what he's missing is the ability to train with other people in these running workouts, where he's distracted and he has to focus on the salience of these items. So the only time he gets to practice these items is when he races in a meet. And he's a racer. When he gets in a meet, he, he runs to win. And that's first priority. Mechanics are second. Now he can usually tell you at the end of the race what he did wrong, but during the race he obviously wasn't preoccupied with that. He was preoccupied with winning. So I'd rather have a racer that wants to win because through time you can teach the mechanics and the ability to focus on the fire. If, if you have an athlete that doesn't desire to win, that doesn't enjoy racing, then you have a much harder job. Mr. Thank you very much.